Uh, yes. Let's get to uh, this morning's top stories. Federal trial of those three ex-cops charged in George Floyd's death that continues today in Minneapolis. Yesterday, the clerk who flagged Floyd's alleged counterfeit bill testified. Jurors also heard from a witness who pleaded with officers to help as Floyd was passing out. The officers are accused of violating Floyd's civil rights by not stopping Derek Chauvin from killing him. Our justice correspondent, Candace Kelly, is here with more on the testimony and what we can expect. And Candace, I know you've been watching closely uh, the second day of witness testimony here. The jurors heard from that store clerk, as we said, Cup Foods, um, which we, we came to learn well. What did he say? Well, you know, I think that the reason why the prosecution brought this store clerk once again to the witness stand was to say, listen, this is the last time that we saw George Floyd. So he really just kind of painted the facts about what happened that day with the $20 bill, how he went back out to the car a couple of times to try to negotiate with George Floyd to ask him, was this counterfeit and could he make good on it? But he brought us to the scene of the crime. And again, the scene of the crime where George Floyd was alive. We also heard from Charles McMillan. Now, you might recall, he was the 61-year-old older gentleman who mm. was driving by, got out of his car, um, he cried on the stand just talking about what it was like for him to be a part of that day. And I think what these witnesses did was say, listen, we were there. We saw what was going on as it was unfolded. And we saw George Floyd alive. And so painting that picture, painting that foundation as to how this man went from alive to dead, I think that's what the prosecution was trying to establish here. One thing that we also got from the people who took the stand was a matter of perspective. They did ask Charles McMillan, the 61-year-old, did you really see everything clearly? Could you see behind the car? So while you may have thought you, you, know, you saw one thing or perhaps you didn't see one thing on cross, the defense was trying to get out. Maybe you didn't see the whole picture, uh, maybe trying to disqualify him mm. as a witness. But certainly we know that as a witness, he had uh, quite an impact during the state case. And he also had an impact during this federal case, too, Sharon. Yeah, and Candace, the former officer, Thomas Lane, now we've learned that, that he will take the stand. He'll testify. What will he say? Um, and isn't that risky? You know, it could be risky, but I think for Thomas Lane, out of the three officers, he was the one who was the least culpable, if you can put it that way. In other words, again, when we look at perspective, we are going to see and hear about from his view what he saw. We're also going to see his video cam, that perspective, which is very different from many of the other things that we've seen. We're going to see a Thomas Lane uh, that the defense attorneys will paint as someone who was uh, compassionate, asked George that George Floyd be turned over a couple of times, that fell on deaf ears. We're also going to hear how he got on the, the medical van that came, the ambulance, to really see this to the end, to see if George Floyd could be revived. And again, there is video footage that if anybody's interested in seeing online, it is an interesting perspective to see what he was, was seeing on that day as opposed to all the other cameras on that day. We're also going to hear about the training and, and that he was trained to do perhaps what he did. Defense attorneys will say that he was uh, subservient to the person in charge, and that was Derek Chauvin. So once again, pointing the fingers at Derek Chauvin. And finally, we're going to hear that this is a man that is about to have a baby. So when we are talking to a jury mm. and we're trying to get compassionate ears, a baby is on the way. And if I were his uh, attorney, I would say, you know what, go ahead and take the stand because you are the one who can give your personal account and add some compassion and humanity to who you are, to who you are and who you were that day. Perhaps uh, it will be a compelling story that he'll, he'll tell, but it will be challenged. Does it, though, put pressure, I wonder, on the other officers? We know from opening statements that attorneys for uh, all three will blame Derek Chauvin, uh, but what other tactics will they use? Because we watched the, the kookiness, really, of the state trial, Candace, the exhaust fumes and, and alleged drugs causing the death instead of nine-plus minutes on At Mr. Floyd's neck. We will hear the, the finger-pointing, as we know. That's going to be the base and is the base of their argument. But then we have to look at what was going on with the system? Defense attorneys have said, this is a broken system. And yes, this was a tragedy, but that doesn't mean that these men were the men who, who committed the crime. They are going to talk about the training, that the police training, and it has been revamped since then, that that was to blame. And the fact that it was revamped does mean something. Um, and, and what does it mean when you're a rookie cop? 
are you able to do anything that you want? They're going to say that these officers, they weren't able to do what they want. They really had no uh, decision-making power in the situation. They were looking to Derek Chauvin, and Derek Chauvin is the one who made all of the decisions. And, of course, we're going to see about their positioning of the body. It was Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck. We had the two other officers that were on the back and the leg, and then we had two towel. His defense attorneys were going to say his back was to the whole situation. So how can you blame him? Look at the crowd. The crowd was out of control, and he was the one who was actually keeping it in control. And those are going to be the theories that they put forth in order to try to defend these three defendants. Unchallenged, that sounds like it is a compelling, as I said, story. But how do you think the prosecution is going to wake everyone up to what our eyes actually saw and what our ears actually heard. Because, you know, at an academy, right, Candace, they can't train you for every life situation. Can't that legally come into play? It can come into play, but, you know, during opening arguments, the prosecution made it clear that this was a case in their, in their, in their eyes about the, the ability and the role of them to protect and serve, and they did the complete opposite. They did not protect mm -hmm. and serve. They're going to go into all of the training that they went through in order to help people like George Floyd. Whether someone commits a crime or not, if you see someone that is distressed, if you see someone that is uh, going to lose their life, they still have a fiduciary duty to step in. And what did they do, according to the prosecution? They turned their backs. So while they can't, you know, be be right in every situation, they're going to say that this, at the very base, is the foundation of what it takes to be a police mm -hmm. officer, and they acted mm -hmm. the complete opposite, Sharon. We're out of time, but quickly, yes or no, does it put pressure on the other officers, the other two, to testify, Candace? It does. It absolutely does. We want to see them be humans. When We want to see compassion. We want to hear from their own perspective what they were saying. That certainly does make a difference. Of course, the cameras will do the talking, but hearing from them also makes uh, more of an impact for the jurors. I know better than to ask a lawyer yes or no. You answer the way you <laughs> know how to answer it, Candace. Thank you, Candace Kelly, for the latest. Uh, we appreciate that.